So I'm here to give you a tour of open source on the mainframe. And just to provide a little background. Um, so as the introduction said, um, I've, I've actually been coming to All Things Open for several years um, and giving talks about various things in the open source and infrastructure space. Um, this is the first time I'll be talking about mainframes because my previous jobs were all just standard sort of Linux systems administration jobs. Um, my first job I started out on-prem. I was racking servers and putting CDs in them to install Debian. Um, from there, I moved into cloud things and worked on OpenStack for a while. Then I spent a couple of years working on containers with Apache Mesos and then Kubernetes. And then about two years ago, um, I left the startup I was at in San Francisco and I was like, I need something different. <laughs> um, so I spent a couple months thinking about what I wanted to do moving forward in my career. Um, Kubernetes was really taking off and that was interesting, but I had just kind of been on the OpenStack ride and I wanted something just different. Um, so I reached out to my contacts and I was looking around to find what I want to do, if I wanted to go into infrastructure, if I wanted to do developer advocacy. Um, and that's how I found myself talking to the IBM Z group. IBM Z is another name for the this line of servers that IBM um, puts out that are mainframes. So I now find myself in a role at IBM where I got to learn a ton about this really awesome mainframe hardware, but I'm still doing a lot of open source work and I'm getting to use all of that infrastructure knowledge I gained while being a Linux sysadmin in order to reach out to folks like you to talk to you about how cool mainframes are. Um, this picture in the slide here is not a modern mainframe, <laughs> in case you didn't guess. Um, that's a System 360. It's the first mainframe that IBM came out with. Um, this was in Poughkeepsie last year um, when I was visiting some colleagues. And uh, they have a little museum in their manufacturing and assembly division. And so we got to go over there and check out the old servers. So that was a lot of fun. I got to see the new servers too. <laughs> Um, so that's that's about my background. Um, I like to say like I used to do on-prem things and I did cloud things and now in the mainframe space it's very much both. So like when people get a mainframe installed it's in their data center. Um, but IBM Cloud also has mainframes in it for some of their secure services. So that's really interesting stuff that I've been learning. But I'm here to talk to you about the open source side of things. Um, but first I wanted to explain what a mainframe is because two years ago if you had asked me, I would have said like, um, big computer, old thing. <laughs> uh, so mainframes are big computers. Um, they don't have storage inside of the, the mainframe itself. Um, but they these days, they, they sit in like a standard 19 inch rack spot for their like single um, frame versions. And like this picture here, it's a four frame um, Z15. And so it fits in four 19 inch rack spaces. So you don't need a special place in your data center for these mainframes anymore. They're not as big as a room. Um, and then you connect them to um, storage on another machine. So you buy like a storage device. There's a bunch of manufacturers that, that make them these days. So you have your mainframe, which is all pretty much processing power. And this is what they look like inside. Um, was really hard for me to find this picture when I first started because I was like, I want to see what's inside. And people around me were like, does that matter? You're never going to like see one on the outside. You just remote into it all the time. And I'm like, that's not the point. I want to see the cool blinky lights and like all the really cool hardware stuff that's inside the machine. Um, eventually I found my tribe and they got me like all the great pictures of the inside. Um, but anyway, as I said, it's like raw processing power inside of one of these machines. Um, in the center there, it's kind of hard to read because there's not a great color to impose on top of um, the system diagram, but there's like five drawers, just full processors with giant heat sinks. Um, you've got your memory um, and then you've got like the two on the side there. Um, they're just full of IO cards. So those connect out to IO, they do some of the processing. Um, there's also like your PCIe cards are in there. So like your crypto cards, your HSMs, pretty much like tons of specialized cards inside of these machines. Um, this machine here happens to be the water cooled system, but there is an air cooled version as well. Um, and they're trying to do more air cooled because that's easier to fit in the standard data center. 
um, you've got your gigabit switches, but typically you'd, you'd connect your um, mainframe up to something faster um, networking wise. Um, support elements, what those are is how you interact with the mainframe. So those run a small operating system that allows you to interact with everything and then connect like access to all your um, operating systems and whatnot. And a really important thing here is that it's not x86. So it is an architecture that if you're, if you're talking to like mainframers, they'll call it something like Z architecture or they'll call it IBM Z. In the open source world, we refer to it as S390X. Just like, you know, 64-bit x86, we call uh, like AMD 64. So like if you look at the binary, if you find a binary that says S390X, that is the mainframe architecture. Um, the point of this architecture is that it's really good at processing data because it has big caches in the CPU. Um, and then in a fully loaded like four frame machine, like we saw a picture of, there's 190 5.2 gigahertz processors. Each processor has 12 cores. Um, and then the machine itself has 40 terabytes of RAM. Um, and then you saw all those PCIe um, drawers. So those are like, they have the offload processors and um, in lots and lots of drawers <laughs> of processors. And again, there's like tons of really cool pictures I can show you later if you ask me of like the internals of all this stuff and what all the cards look like. And um, they're very pretty. <laughs> um, but again, it's not x86. So that's important. Um, so again, if you had asked me two years ago what runs on a mainframe, I would have like waved my hands and said something, something proprietary things. Um, but it turns out Linux has been running on the mainframe for uh, over 20 years now. And I'll get into the history of that. But speaking on the topic of the type of um, processor it has and that it's not an x86, my first question, again, I had trouble finding an answer to it because people didn't understand what I was asking, was what does it mean if you say like SUSE Enterprise Linux Server and Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Ubuntu, what does it mean when you say those run on this? Does that mean everything in the software repository for these respective distributions has been ported to this, this new chipset, this X, uh, S390X chipset? Because that's what you need to do when you are running on a processor that is like an ARM processor, a power processor, an S390X processor. You need to compile or interpret your software in order to use it on there. So did that mean that everything's been recompiled and now we have everything in SLES. So the answer to that is no, but it is enough so that SLES is a you know, fully functioning system, um, that Ubuntu is totally a fully functioning system. And so what the distributions do is they work um, in collaboration with the community and with IBM and like um, Suze, Red Hat and Canonical, they all have um, mainframes in their build farms. So they, that's how they run all of their builds. Um, Debian leverages some of the ones um, at one of our partners, uh, Marist College. Um, Clef OS is, is maintained by one of um, IBM's partners. OpenSUSE and Fedora use SUSE and, and Red Hat respectively um, mainframes um, to build their systems. Um, I believe Alpine was ported by an intern at IBM a couple of years ago, and that's used for a lot of the container stuff. Um, but the idea here is that it's, it's a lot of Linux um, and, and a lot of open source software. Um, in fact, the first thing I did when I got a, a VM um, running Linux on the mainframe was I installed Screen and IRC, the IRC client. And I, I hopped on IRC and I was like, ah, oh, check out all these cool stats and my proxy PU info. And like, because like I'm a nerd and that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> um, and I can't imagine there was a client that said, hey, I need this text-based IRC client ported for me. Um, I think it just built. And then Ubuntu was like, hey, sure, this built, let's ship it. Um, and it works fine. Um, so that's, that's what it means when you're running Linux on this. It's not everything in the repository, but it is a huge chunk of it. Um, another thing that's worth pointing out is that KVM is one of the ways you can control virtual machines on the mainframe. Traditionally, you'd use ZVM. ZVM is proprietary virtualization technology that came out in the 1970s and has been continually improved since then. And it is the most amazing virtualization technology I've ever seen, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I guess when you've got, you know, 45 years to work on something, it's, it's 
not going to be bad. Um, and it really is amazing. Um, but you want to use KVM if you want integration and in things like libvert. And so like in, in this scenario, we have like in our, um, we have this Linux one community cloud, we use OpenStack to deploy uh, the VMs on the mainframe because it's just using libvert and KVM. So it's really easy to do. Um, and so in that case, Linux is running like a really thin install of Linux and then KVM is actually doing the virtualization on the mainframe to manage all of your Linux systems. Um, and then there's a bunch of proprietary operating systems, which I mentioned because you'll run into them if your organization has a mainframe, um, but we're not really gonna get into them very much because I'm here to talk about open source. So um, I joined IBM at a really pivotal time in the mainframe world because it has been a very proprietary thing for a very long time. Um, and like this, this new wave of open source where the term open source exists in the past 20 years um, and where there, there are really strong um, organizations and foundations and things focused around open source. Like this is kind of like the latest wave of open source in computing. But if you go back to essentially when computers started being things that existed in the world, um, people were already getting together. Um, they didn't call it open source software <laughs> um, because that was not really a thing. Um, but in 1955, a bunch of just users of the IBM 701, which was a precursor to mainframes, um, they created a user group. So it was people across companies and universities and governments who were just using these machines and they shared their software library. Like share was essentially a library and a bunch of users and they just shared their programs that they wrote. Um, in 1959, um, they wrote the um, share operating system, um, which was the first of like, the, I guess what you could call a true operating system ever to exist in the world. Um, because previously they were just independent utilities and this brought things together into an operating system. And that SOS operating system was eventually adopted by IBM as the operating system used in some of their early systems. And this is just a quote from, from Wikipedia about share. It's just like, it was one of the first like commons based peer production things in the world. And it's kind of like a precursor to the modern open source movement. Um, and so there is this open source legacy that exists in the mainframe. Another one is the VM community. I mentioned ZVM, which again, it's proprietary these days, but in the early days, it, I guess you can still say it was proprietary, but a lot of companies, universities, governments, they all got together and were working on it together and, and like nudging IBM and saying, listen, virtualization, it's going to be big. <laughs> um, if you're interested in this history, which I totally was, there's like a uh, there's, there's a paper um, written by uh, Melinda Varian um, talking about the VM community and she goes through like 20 years of history and she gets into like all the versions and all of the components that were involved um, and, and how IBM wasn't quite on board with virtualization for a very long time. <laughs> um, but there were like, I guess, proto developer advocates back in the day who were like at IBM and they were listening to the community and attending all the share events and part of the VM community and they were like, listen, IBM, we need to pay attention to this virtualization thing because it's important. Um, but things have gotten much better. <laughs> and then if you skip forward 1970s, 1980s, at the end of the 90s, there was a group of folks that got together and were like, hey, what if we can put Linux on a mainframe? And just to remind you of this time, um, this is when like, funny funny essays like how to install Linux on a dead badger came out and all kinds of like silly things about you can install Linux on everything and it was kind of like a hobby that people got into like you could just install Linux on all kinds of things and it was a lot of fun so it was it started as like a hobby project um and the community members were like well we're doing this thing and then IBM's like oh my gosh we're working on that too um so there was the community port and then in December 1999 IBM released the first just like binary blob Linux kernel patches for the mainframe for S390X. And so IBM support of it is now just almost almost 21 years on Z. And that was like a 2-2 kernel. So this was, this was some time ago. 
Um, a few organizations got involved in releasing Linux versions, um, but the first one that still exists now um, was SLES. So Suzanne Enterprise Linux Server was the first real like still in production enterprise server um, to support Linux. Um, and that was in October 2000. And that one is, is interesting because I know it's just a branding thing, but technically when Suze came out with this, it was called an enterprise server because it ran on mainframes. Um, they came out with the x86 version and branded it the same way because like everything's enterprise, anyone can use this, several months later. So I like to say that x86 is actually the SLES port. <laughs> Um, anyway, Red Hat came out soon, soon after SLES, they, their um, Red Hat version for the enterprise came out on S390X. Um, Ubuntu support eventually came along, that was in 2016 and began with the 1604 release. Um, moving forward a few more years, um, eventually IBM was like, hey, we should have a Linux only mainframe. So in 2015, they did this big splash, like a keynote at the Linux Foundation's Linux Con. Um, where they had um, like some of the, the shells of these machines. They didn't actually bring a mainframe, they bought like the shell so people could get selfies with it of their first Linux One machines. So they had the Emperor and the Rock Hopper. Um, Emperors are big penguins, Rock Hoppers are little penguins. So you could say the big one is the Emperor, little one's the Rock Hopper. In 2017, they came out with the second iteration, the Emperor Two and the Rock Hopper Two. And then last year in September, um, the Linux One Three came out. They dropped the cute penguin names, <laughs> um, but then the Rock Hopper 2 was the first one that actually fit into like a 19 inch rack spot, but now they all fit into that spot as of last year. So the Linux 1.3 and the Z15, they're all 19 inches. So they just fit in a normal space. And I don't tell you this because I'm trying to sell you one because I don't know how, and they won't let me have one either. Huh? <laughs> um, but I am gonna be able to get you free access to one. So. Stay tuned, I will talk about that in a few slides. Um, and the other thing is that like IBM does not invest in products unless they are very serious about them. And so not only did they release one of these in 2015, they've been doing it every two years since then. So like, this is, I mean, for me, this is really solid proof that Linux is winning for them. And there is a really good strategy here around Linux on the mainframe. And it's really backed by like, they have like, whole marketing team devoted to Linux One. They have, I mean, they hired me <laughs> um, and they, they have a whole bunch of people working on it. Um, so they're very like super serious about um, using uh, Linux um, on the mainframe these days. Just get some water. So kind of cycling back to where I was talking about, um, what it means when you when you run Linux on the mainframe. Um, there's a lot of porting work going on. So some of it just works fine. Um, if you're a small open source project written in Python or Go, um, Node.js, your application will probably just run fine. Um, if you're doing lower level languages, that that is where you can sometimes run into Endian problems because mainframe is big Endian, x86, little Endian. So that's like related to um, memory. Um, and how things are allocated in the languages. So sometimes you do find issues with memory if you're using a lower le level language and are doing very specific hardware, some close to hardware stuff. Um, but if you are just using, you know, Python again, like that's, it's just gonna run probably fine. Um, but there are some things like I saw an issue with Golang recently because someone was calling out to an assembler interpreter and the assembler interpreter inside of Go is um, very x86 focused. Um, so it was, they were seeing some bugs with S390X. Um, there was a TensorFlow bug that I saw recently because some of the data sets weren't, weren't working as it was expected um, when they were doing the machine learning work. Um, but these are all things that are being worked on. Um, and this is kind of just our vanity slide of like, here's a lot of open source, like major open source projects. Um, and here's how they're running on the, on mainframe, like these are all like verified ones from both IBM and the partners. So lots of really good stuff. Um, and there's a link on the bottom here. There are also Docker images. Um, if you're in the container world, um, this is just another sampling of them. These are the official Docker images on Docker Hub. Um, and so again, since these are 
on a on S three ninety X architecture, you have to build the container for the software to run. So you can use your same Docker file and just add in like an architecture flag. And then when you're building it, you just build for the specific ar architecture and you have to be on that machine to build for that architecture. Um, but I, I can give you a free VM so you can do that easily. <laughs> um, but there's, there's all kinds of tools out there again. It's like a whole wide world of, of great stuff. Um, and one of the other things I wanted to mention is um, I mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned in the beginning, there's, there's crypto cards inside of mainframes. So there's a crypto coprocessor inside of the, the general processor. And then there's also things like your HSM, um, we call it a crypto express card, which handles like key storage and things like that. Um, but, and, and I was worried that in order to use this stuff, you might have to use like some IBM proprietary blobby thing. And because I, I've worked on other architectures before and I know how it can sometimes be. Whereas like, if you wanna use the hardware support, sure, like add this giant glob onto your SSL binary or use an entire binary entirely that's different. And now you have to wedge that into your Apache config. But it's not that way. <laughs> um, it is like the support is actually built into OpenSSL. You just add the changes in, in your config file um, to use the, um, the libICA um, crypto library for S390X. And then you're automatically using the crypto library or the crypto hardware inside the mainframe processors to do everything from like SSH to Apache mod SSL. Kernel level, you're just using DM crypt. So when you're encrypting your disk, you're not using special tooling. You're using the hardware on the mainframe, but you're still just using DM crypt. So it's stuff that you're just familiar with already. Um, and then you know, if you're using AES crypto, that's built into the language too. So you can be using crypto on go and leveraging the mainframe hardware. And this was like, I was still run into some proprietary bit, but it's mostly a really good situation. <laughs> um, and that's, that's really exciting. So how do you go about finding what open source is available for Linux on the mainframe? Um, so the first thing I would do um, is just search your package repository in your Ubuntu or SLES or Red Hat or whatever and just see if builds exist um, and, and see if the package exists already in your operating system. If you do, you know, apt git install, you're good. Sorry, apt install. <laughs> um, and then, then you've got it. Um, and then if, if that doesn't work, um, you could go to the project website and see if they have S390X builds. Um, if not, um, you can also look at the IBM verified software list, which is the one I linked on that slide and it's linked here too. Um, that one has all the ones that IBM is working on with the community and with um, other partners in the ecosystem. And in, if, if it, there's not a software package for it, there are build instructions for it. So some of them will have just a list of build instructions um, to build it on Z. And sometimes it's tweaking a configuration file and sometimes it's making other changes. Um, again, Docker Hub. Um, you, since you have to search for the architecture, this, this link here um, actually specifically searches for S390X ones. Um, and again, on places like Docker Hub, be aware that there are official images that are good, but you should always audit things before you just run a random container, because there are containers that are uploaded by random people like me, <laughs> and sometimes malicious people too, so just be careful. Um, just make sure you do audits on everything you're working with. Um, and then one thing I'm really excited about is the software discovery tool from the Open Mainframe Project. Um, this is one that I've been working on. Um, it uses Flask and Python. Um, Flask is a, a, a Python um, web application framework. Um, and it has a JSON backend of a bunch of software um, that is available. So right now the, the tool searches um, SLES, Red Hat, and Ubuntu. Um, defined packages. So then you can search across all three of those distributions. Um, we want to add in Debian, uh, Clef OS, and also ZOS, because as I'll get to, there's also uh, open source software for ZOS. So we want this to be a software discovery tool to like finally end this 
really long search for, is it on Docker Hub? Is it on the verified software list? Is it in the distros? You just have one place to go to, to find this stuff because right now it's really just hard to find. <laughs> now, if you are an open source project and are interested in porting your open source project to this architecture, um, you have a few tools available to you. Um, the first is uh, uh, canonical hosts launchpad.net, which is like their like code sharing and build environment for Ubuntu. But in the personal package archive section, you can build your package for other architectures. So you create your dev package, upload the source for that, and then it builds the dev packages for x86 and whatever ones you want, ARM, I think power's in there, and S390X, you can just check a check mark and it'll build, build for you. Um, similarly, the OpenSUSE build service will also build for S390X. I think that one's actually automatic. Um, so again, these are using the mainframes that you know Canonical and, and, and SUSE have, but they're letting community members build their software on it, which is super cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Um, there's also, if your project is using Jenkins and you can use external builders, the Oregon State University Open Source Lab runs some S390X Jenkins builders, um, so you can apply to use those. Um, last year, Travis CI launched a beta program for open source projects where they um, now allow you to, for open source projects, they're allowed, they, they, they can have access to containers to run um, multiple CPU architectures in their tests. So now they have ARM, Power, and S390X. So you can just add a few lines to your Travis config and then use containers um, on those platforms, which is pretty cool. And this last one is the Linux One Community Cloud. And that is that free access to a mainframe I was talking about. So it's at developer.ibm.com slash Linux One. It gives you a VM for 120 days uh, currently, your options are SLES or RHEL, um, so you can just pick one of those and launch the VM. It's a pretty beefy VM for a, a free VM, I'll say. I was very surprised when I logged in. I was like, wow, this has a lot of resources, actually. That's pretty cool. Um, it is a shared environment, so I wouldn't do a lot of benchmarking and things on it because it is still like it's a community environment hosted at a university that we partner with. Um, so I wouldn't say like, if you want to do benchmarking on a mainframe, you should probably do it somewhere else. <laughs> um, but it is it is a really nice place to be able to play around with your application, see if your open source project builds. Um, and then if you do need access beyond that 120 days, um, we don't have a way to extend your VM, but I can put you in contact with the folks who run the system. And we have like a special place set aside for open source projects who want to use it for their CI system or just, their developers testing on it or whatnot. So we can actually set aside a specific thing for you um, to uh, work on your open source project. Just reach out to me. So that is a lot of Linux stuff. So you can do tons of Linux stuff on the mainframe. Yay. And mainframes are super awesome modern hardware. That's awesome. But um, I will say that if you if you find yourself working on a mainframe, that probably means you're at a company or an organization that uses mainframes. And you are definitely going to run into ZOS at some point or ZVM or any of the other Z proprietary operating systems that are out there. So is there open source projects for these two? Of course. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we're, I'm not gonna go through all of these, um, but one of the things that we're super excited about this year is that Ansible, can now control certain components of your ZOS system. So we're, I think just, this is probably six months ago that we came out with the first Ansible playbooks um, that allow you to do, um, uh, do a bunch of manipulation on the ZOS side. So you still run Ansible on like your Linux machine, wherever that is, it can be on Z or it can just be, you know, on your cloud or whatever, um, but it can now control a bunch of the stuff inside of ZOS and that, is really amazing because now you don't need to be like, you need to understand the fundamentals of ZOS to understand what you're actually manipulating and what you're changing on the system. But you don't have to use the green on black terminals. You don't need to be familiar with all of that old stuff, which I think is really cool and fun. <laughs> um, but if it was seriously my job, the learning curve is quite steep for ZOS. Um, so Ansible is, is, is lowering the barrier to entry to that a lot. And so what what admins are doing now is they're like learning things on Ansible, 
And then when they need to do more complicated things, that is when they're getting their feet wet with the, um, the, the deeper components um, of ZOS. And that allows them to be, have some really early wins um, with, with using Ansible and controlling ZOS, but then dig into the stuff when the other stuff when they're ready. Um, I'll talk about Zoe a little bit. Um, we mentioned things like Node and Python and Java running on Linux, but this is them running on ZOS. So you can run your Python applications on ZOS as well. Java has been on the mainframe like for a really long time now because um, Java is, is particularly easy to, to make cross-platform. Um, a couple that I'm really excited about, Git and Bash. Those are both maintained by Rocket Software. Um, and so you can download the, the open source versions for those. Um, and the Git stuff is great because it allows you to integrate like DevOpsy pipelines and things um, by just pulling things directly from Git on your ZOS system. And we'll talk about DevOps in a minute too. And the other thing I wanted to talk about is the open mainframe project. Now, currently a lot of these projects are very focused on ZOS and the other um, operating systems traditionally. Um, like my software discovery tools in there and that one crosses the border into Linux. Um, there is a, um, oh yeah, the anomaly detection engine for Linux logs that allows you to pull in um, Linux logs into the same um, reporting format that, that ZOS logs are in so that like traditional mainframers can read Linux logs because they're just, they're so different that um, having like a unified panel for all of your, your logging um, was, was really valuable to them. Um, but what the Open Mainframe Project does is they are part of the Linux Foundation. And so we have like a board and a technical group um, and they sort of oversee everything. And they come from a variety of companies. IBM is just one of them. Um, and they oversee the project. Um, the project provides project hosting for all these projects. Um, so that means like virtual machines and they help them with CI systems. They they really like hold our hands or like, okay, let me help you set up your first meeting. Let me um, get everyone signed up to your mailing list. And they really walk you through the process. Um, they just had their inaugural summit last, last month. So it was a big online conference. It had originally supposed to be in person, <laughs> um, but they had a big virtual event. Um, and now they have mini summits. So um, in, a, in I think next week, week after they're, they're hosting a mini summit at the open source um, Summit EU, um, where they have like a little bunch of little mainframe talks about the projects. Um, but I don't want to get too far into this because there is a talk later today, uh, 4 30 Eastern, um, by the program director of the Open Mainframe Project. And he's going to talk about the project and how they're helping develop this sustainable open source ecosystem um, through the project. So if you are interested in this topic, be sure to check out this talk. John's a great speaker and a great person. So head over there. But I did want to talk about Zoe <laughs> because it's really cool. Um, so Zoe is like, it, it's a few different things, but it, essentially it's an API um, that hooks into your ZOS system and gets to pull out data and do lots of changes. So this is what um, a lot of the, the modern like tooling you'll see uses. And so these these tutorials that I, that I linked here, um, they're ways people are like, creating mobile applications that hook into the mainframe. Um, they're using things like um, Flutter to create things like that. Um, this one um, from Viacom Infinity, they are using like an, an Alexa alternative. It's an open source voice activated assistant and that's calling back to a mainframe. So he's able to like speak commands to it and then it goes back to a mainframe and then it gets results back. And that's a really fun conference talk to watch. <laughs> Um, and then again, like, like mainframe DevOps stuff. Um, so there's a command line tool for Zoe that you run like on your local system. So you can run it just on your Linux laptop or your Mac or whatever um, and run Zoe and then trigger commands. And the really cool thing about that is it allows you to use like any CI system. If you want to run a job you, through Zoe on your mainframe, you just give the CI system that bash command and like have Zoe installed somewhere, the Zoe command line client. And then it'll go and run your job on the mainframe, bring back the result, and then you can pull that into your CI system. So it's allowing a lot of flexibility in that way that didn't really exist previously on the mainframe. But 
I won't, I won't go into stealing John's thunder anymore about the open mainframe project, but they are doing really cool stuff over there. And then that brings us like, again, DevOps stuff. So one of the things that's been really important to the mainframe community is modernizing applications and modernizing the ways that developers interact with the mainframe. Um, it's why it's a really exciting time for me to be part of this is because I did, you know, DevOps and cloud stuff in my past roles. Um, and so coming into the world of mainframe and ZOS and really seeing like how old some of their processes are. <laughs> I mean, you've got this amazingly modern hardware and like you can run Linux on it and that all side is really great. But if you still have to learn um, ISPF and I mean, there's abbreviations for everything in mainframe land. Um, but if you had to learn all the, all the older tooling, it becomes a real barrier for new developers. And it, it's very frustrating. And I, I've talked to people who were like Linux admins six years ago and said, you know, my work wanted to get me into the mainframe stuff, but I really couldn't do it because it was just, the learning curve was intense. Um, but by bringing in a lot of the DevOps tooling and also starting to talk about DevOps process, like my team is now doing agile training. <laughs> Um, which would have been unheard of in the mainframe space a few years ago. Um, and this is just a quote from one of the articles I was reading in one of the trade magazines. It was like, you know, it's not, your, your developers no longer have to adapt to the mainframe world. Um, we're adapting to the way that modern developers work today. And that means using things like Git and Jenkins and, and moving away from waterfall development methodologies and into the more agile things. Um, so there's lots of really cool stuff going on. <laughs> and that is where I wanted to conclude. I did want to just say a couple things about how it's been for me working in this very enterprisey world in open source. Um, it's a very different place than where I've worked. I mean, even though I've worked on OpenStack, which was definitely very corporate, um, but you had still a lot of people with open source background. Um, I like to say sometimes like I, I worked on Debian, I worked on Ubuntu, and I worked on all of this with like the same people in OpenStack. And now a lot of those same people are working on Kubernetes. And like, it's, it's just, there's a lot of open source core to a lot of this. Um, but in the mainframe world, that's not quite as true. Um, it's been really interesting working with people whose relationships are a lot more formal. Um, there's a lot of partnerships involved. Um, a lot of companies who are partnering with IBM and there's you know, like sometimes when I want to give a VM to an open source project, I have to check internally with the team to see if there's like some strategic business partnership. So someone else will own that relationship. And like, it's very different than the world I used to work in, like when I was working on Debian and we were just building packages and putting them up in the repository. Like, <laughs> um, and it's also, I mean, it's really exciting for me because I get to do a lot of internal training about open source because people inside of IBM are a little bit shy to share what they're learning and what they're working on, even if it is very open and they're allowed to, like I'm nudging them. Like I wanted one of them to give this talk, but there's no, no, no. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to like pull people out of their shells at, at IBM and it through our partners. And like one of the ways that we did that recently is we had IBM Z day, a conference last month. And like, I just went to like all my, like the most technical contacts I could find in like other companies. I was like, hey, you should give a talk on this. And they're like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, but you're the most brilliant person I know on this topic. And they're like, well, I have to check with legal. And then it was all fine. Everyone was able to speak and they were great. So <laughs> um, it's just a very different world of teaching the enterprise folks how to do open source and that they are allowed to share it. And we want them to in this, in this world. Um, so that's where I'm really excited that the open mainframe project is doing so well, like 2020 for all its faults, it's been a banner year with the open mainframe project. There's a bunch of new projects. There's a new uh, open source COBOL class, um, that open source by me, anyone can contribute to the COBOL class. It's still for COBOL enterprise, but there's like all kinds of interesting stuff happening with the project and like, it's really gaining momentum after like, um, five years of work put into building up to this point. Um, but people are getting it and we're bringing a lot more people into the open source world. So I am going to exit my slides and stop sharing my screen. And if anyone has any questions, I will be taking them now.
Well, let's let's give our speaker a, a virtual round of applause, and we do have uh, one. Well, we'll say one question and one comment in the Q and A right now. But y'all can add your questions there for about the next four minutes. We've got left. Um, Christine asks if the mainframe business is going to remain a part of IBM, or if it's going to be spun off in the new world of IBM's new company that they announced. And I have no idea if you know the answer to that. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that that's a great question. So, um, I don't. For for those of you who haven't heard the news, um, IBM is is splitting off part of the organization to focus on like, um, I forget. Or they're doing something, and then there's like the I, IBM core wants to focus on like hybrid cloud and stuff. So the mainframe is actually part of the hybrid cloud. Staying in IBM, um, mainframe is an important part of cloudy stuff that we're doing because we do have mainframe cloud things and offerings and all that stuff. So nothing's going to change for me, really. It's a good question, though. We were asking it, too. <laughs> Great. Uh, the only other uh, question in there uh, right now is currently John just pointed out that he knew who uh, ported oh. Alpine Linux over. Uh, that was uh, Tuan uh, Huang, who was a open right. uh, mainframe project yeah. uh, at MT. Open mainframe project. That's right. I knew it was a mentee or an intern or something, but you're okay. Thank you for clarifying. Yes, it was an open mainframe project. So that's what the open mainframe project does. They have a mentoring program. That's cool. <laughs> so, so, any other questions? Well, um, I'm going to put these slides on my website and I'll tweet them out. And if anyone has questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer them. 